Hi, it's Andy Hoffman, Media Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 25th year in business. Today's audio blog is being taped on Thursday, May 15th at midday, a day earlier than usual, as I'd finished my preparations and with such crazy things going on in the world, I figured I'd just put it out a day earlier. Uh, the title of the audio blog is Something Very, Very Bad Will Happen Very, Very Soon. And uh, given what's going on in the world, it's hard to believe that the powers that be, no matter how much they print money and manipulate markets, can prevent it. In recent weeks, here at the Miles Franklin blog, we have detailed how the world's politicians and central bankers have shifted their historic money printing, market manipulation, and propaganda scheme into hyperdrive as the end game of currency collapse rapidly moves from the world of inevitability to that of potential imminence. By now, it is beyond the realm of doubt that the global economy is rapidly deteriorating, in most regions at levels well below that of even the 2008 global meltdown, as I call it, or even 2011's global meltdown too. We have long discussed the concept of QE to infinity, and in our view, the entire world is about to embrace its meaning. Not that the average Joe in the 99% hasn't already. However, now that financial markets are no longer responding to the power that be's unrelenting manipulations, the entire 100% will soon be fearful. And don't forget that extra 1% controls 90% of the money. So if they start sensing fear, there's no telling what might happen especially as central banks like the Fed, ECB, and Bank of Japan spent essentially all their financial ammo saving the world from the prior two crises. Essentially, the world's largest central banks and sovereign governments went on an historic spending spree in 2008, with printed money of course, praying it would prevent what appeared to be an imminent breakdown of the financial system. Markets and confidence were buoyed for three years, but by 2011, new financial crises engulfed the world like the Ebola virus, particularly in Europe, which nearly collapsed under the weight of the pigs. Thus, the central banks decided to double up their money printing efforts, such as the European LTRO scheme, Jap Japan's Abenomics, and of course, America's QE3. Not to mention the behind-the-scenes social financing and shadow banking explosions sanctioned by the Chinese government, which made the rest of the world's money printing efforts pale in comparison. And of course, Mario Draghi's comment that the ECB would do whatever it takes to save the euro, and believe me, it will be enough. This time around, unlike in 2008, when the bankers were clearly taken by surprise, they were a bit more offensive in their kick-the-can strategy, as opposed to the pure deer-in-the-headlights defense utilized in 2008, when each and every day they woke up praying the end of the world hadn't arrived. And thus, the world's leading central bankers, in cahoots with their governments, decided that not only was money printing to be exponentially increased, in many cases covertly, but all financial markets were to be controlled 24-7 and particularly the two that represented the most direct threat to their power base, gold and silver. In doing so, they also launched an historic Goebbels-esque propaganda scheme unprecedented in financial history. To that end, the term recovery was applied to any and all economic situations, whilst tapering was utilized as a tool to validate such recovery and attack precious metals in the process. It was also deemed that the weather would be the scapegoat for all unfavorable economic data, which, by the way, was determined to be manipulated in a more heavy-handed fashion than at any time in history. And as for black swan events, such as the Ukraine, they would be constantly deemed to be de-escalating, no matter what the actual news suggested. And all along, precious metals were to be denigrated at every possible corner with paper, gold, and silver shorted at such enormous levels that they would eventually fall below the cost of production. Why they didn't just stop at gold 1500 and silver 25 to 30 is beyond me, as at the current levels, global physical demand has exploded, production has plunged, miners are nearly bankrupt, 
and the delicate balance holding together the paper markets with the physical has been gravely endangered. Oh well, no one ever said these guys were brilliant, given that they created this mess and have made it exponentially worse with each successive initiative. To wit, the U.S. national debt was $10 trillion when the 2008 crisis hit, and its labor participation rate 66%. Fast forward today, just six years later, and the U.S. national debt is $17.5 trillion plus $5 trillion off balance sheet due to the nationalization of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the labor participation rate is below 63%. And oh yeah, the prices of food, energy, insurance, and essentially all items we need versus want are at or near all-time highs. Anyhow, the post-2011 confidence and reflation scheme worked for three years as well. Except this time around, the le level of debt accumulation, inflation expansion, and wealth inequality accelerated dramatically faster. To the point that, while the average Jane and Joe's savings and earnings prospects had declined to new lows, the Wall Street scum receiving the vast majority of the newly printed money were receiving record high bonuses. Essentially, the old Wall Street I worked for was replaced by insider and high frequency trading, as well as carry trades with unlimited Fed ZERP funds and the unrelenting support of the PPT in the stock market, the Fed in the bond market, the ESF in the foreign exchange market, and of course, the cartel backing their shorting of gold and silver. Unfortunately, we have reached the point that the markets are no longer cooperating as real economic data is plunging into the abyss, inflation surging uncontrollably, the global uh, currency wars raging, and valuations of equities, even in central bank supported markets, reaching bubble like levels previously witnessed only at major tops like in 1929, 2000, and 2008. Seeing the otherworldly data depicting New York Stock Exchange margin debt exploding above the 2000 peak is utterly breathtaking for me to watch. As in my view, the internet bubble was an unprecedented era of rank speculation and lunacy. This time around, the Bernanke put is the sole reason for such valuations, and now the Yellen put as well, which must be supported by unending QE to prevent an instantaneous collapse. Throw in the hundreds of trillions of derivatives lurking, still unregulated behind the scenes, and you can see how the handful of too big to fail banks holding the vast majority of U.S. stocks and real estate for that matter will quite obviously need to be bailed out indefinitely, and possibly, if you're a depositor, bailed in. Last week, I wrote of the most damning proof yet of Fed failure. That is, the fact that Treasury yields were threatening to break below the levels attained after last spring's initial taper talk rallies, which not uncoincidentally commenced just as the most horrific precious metal raids yet commenced. Specifically, I said that if the benchmark 10-year Treasury yield fell below the quintuple bottom level the Fed had supported at 2.6%, in my article, 2.6% enough said, it was signaled the, to the entire world that the Fed had decidedly failed to create the so-called recovery it was propagandizing. If that occurred, it would mean the market was now anticipating a significant economic decline. And with it, not only the end of tapering, which, as you know, I quantitatively dispro disproved six months ago, but an actual increase in QE, and with it, universal expectations of QE to infinity. The same thing can be said for the Nikkei at 14,000, by the way, as the Bank of Japan, too, is now desperate to prove Abenomics is working. To wit, the 10-year Treasury yield finally broke through 2.6% yesterday, that is Wednesday, with authority, and followed up today by breaching 2.5% as well. I believe it could possibly fall well into the ones before all is said and done, as until hyperinflation expectations replace deflation fears, the entire world, as in Japan, will indeed anticipate QE to infinity. And as the Nikkei 
And as for the Nikkei, once 14,000 is inevitably breached to the downside, there's no telling how much of last year's pre-abonomics gains will be erased, and it started from, I don't know, 8,000 or so. Frankly, Japan's economic situation is so untenable, and its balance sheet so unwieldy, that the odds of hyperinflationary collapse occurring there appear higher than in any major economy. As for this week specifically, it could not have been uglier for those still towing the propaganda line of recovery. Europe's measly 0.2% GDP increase for the first quarter, announced today, following an equally miserable 0.3% increase in the fourth quarter, exemplified just how bad things have gotten, nearly guaranteeing the ECB will take rates to zero at its June meeting, or, or worse, or go negative as we predicted months ago in Draghi's Reckoning Day. In fact, the number was even uglier than the headline print, as essentially all the pigs were negative, with only Germany at a paltry plus 0.8% posting anything meaningfully above zero. Of course, on Wednesday morning, that is yesterday, Germany's widely watched ZEW Investor Expectations Index printed an historic plunge from 43 in March to just 32 in April. And thus, it couldn't be more obvious, the Eurozone is headed for recessionary prints in the coming quarters, particularly in light of the record unemployment rate and otherworldly youth unemployment rate. In fact, the pig stock markets have finally stopped rising in recent weeks, Draghi promises and all. And thus, don't be surprised if the horrific financial and economic situation in Europe retakes center stage in the very near future. In China this week, across the board economic data suggested a dramatically weakening economy, prompting President Xi Jinping to warn of an upcoming period of economic slowing, which of course is the understatement of the century given China appears to be in the early stages of an historic credit bubble collapse. In Japan, where retail sales have literally imploded and trade deficits exploded to record levels, I characterized this morning's plus 5.9% first quarter GDP growth rate, and no, that's not a typo, plus 5.9%. I characterized it as the biggest lie in history, which is the title of today's must-read article. Of course, that dubious title could easily be claimed by the U.S. government as well, based on the economic data that it has put out, such as the various seasonally adjusted, not statistically significant, and likely heavily manipulated diffusion indices, like the Philly Fed and Empire State Manufacturing industry Indices, which were reported this morning as strong, and I put that in quotes, because unless you compare, when you compare them to historical averages, they weren't strong at all, and of course, the telling, most telling signal is that the all-important employment components declined in both. Um, more importantly, as usual, the real empirical data reported, as always, depicted an ongoing epic economic collapse. Tuesday, for instance, April retail sales were reported as zero versus a 0.6% increase estimate. And we're in the spring now, where the weather can't be blamed. Wednesday, the PPI rose 0.6% for the second straight month, both including and excluding non-core items like food and energy. And thus, we're now well above Janet Yellen's 2% inflation target, just as the economy starts to implode. Funny how she said we were below that when she spoke just two days ago. <laughs> Can you say stagflation? Now, care of myriad factors, from money printing to drought to countless other issues, U.S. food prices have now risen by an astonishing 23% in the past four months alone, with no, no end to the pain in sight, and certainly not the droughts. And I'm talking about food price indices, not actually the food prices you paid, which have risen, but, but, but not that much. However, leading supermarket chain Safeway and restaurant chain Landry's uh, among others, just said that they have been eating such increases for such time, but now will be forced to pass them through, which jibes perfectly with the fact the CPI was well below the, C the PPI, but rest assured it is about to catch up. And FYI, under the category of comically transparent government propaganda, 
the Atlanta Fed Business Inflation Expectations Index was simultaneously released on Wednesday. And what a shock. For the second straight month, it was exactly plus 1.9%, or just below the 2% level Whirly Bird Janet said would be utilized as a gauge of when to consider tightening policy, which, of course, will never happen. Oh, and by the way, I didn't even mention Walmart's earnings this morning. They miserably missed earnings and said that next quarter they're going to see significantly lower earnings, even though the winter is over and the weather is better. And part of the reason, of course, is the taxes going up because of Obamacare, which is a blight on, on the economy, will only, which will only make things much worse. Now, uh, today, Thursday, we saw a surge in the aforementioned meaningless Empire State Manufacturing Index, while the Philly Fed maintained its paltry, statistically insignificant, manipulated gains from last month. But as noted above, the most telling segment, employment expectations, fell in both cases, which clearly does not signal economic improvement. Simultaneously, the BLS reported plunging weekly jobless claims, which makes zero sense given the employment expectations I just noted continuing the ongoing collapse of the BLS's credibility that I wrote about following the April NFP report earlier this month in an article titled Three Numbers, Plus 288,000, Plus 234,000, and Minus 806,000, which re represent, respectively, the headline increase in jobs they reported, the number of them that were birth-death created, meaning figment, um, a figment of their imagination, and the amount of people that left the labor force. More importantly, the aforementioned real empirical data stated up before, like April industrial production, collapsed. It was reported to have declined by 0.6% in April versus expectations of unchanged, while manufacturing activity declined 0.4% versus expectations of a 0.4% increase. Not to mention, the NAHB Housing Market Index, again this morning, was reported as unexpectedly plunging from 47 to 45 when it was supposed to be going up to 49. This is a 12-month low, down 30% from where it was in February, despite the better spring weather. But the coup de grace in the debate for biggest lie in history was this morning's April Treasury International Capital, or TIC, report. It was bad enough that it depicted essentially zero international demand for paper U.S. securities. However, when I saw that Russia's $20 billion of Treasury sales was offset by a whopping $40 billion of purchases from the world's newest multi-trillionaire, Belgium, which just happens to be the seat of the European Union, I nearly fell off my chair at the brazenness of the Fed's backdoor QE. Belgium has now purchased $214 billion of Treasuries since the Fed supposedly started tapering last fall, making it the third largest uh, international holder after China and Japan. Its holdings are now $381 billion of U.S. Treasuries, or 80% of this tiny nation's GDP. Putting this farce of such purchases in perspective, the world's largest foreign holders of Treasuries, China and Japan, which are obviously much bigger economies, hold only 12% and 18%, respectively, of their GDP outputs in U.S. Treasuries, compared to 80% for Belgium. Of course, the irony of the situation is that now that the Fed is desperate to prevent rates from falling precipitously, and thus signaling its failure to, to get a recovery to the entire world, it probably would like to undo such backdoor QE. As for precious metals... The ongoing wars at gold 1300 and, as I call it, battlefield $20 silver continue. The cartel is literally going hog wild defending them in their sheer terror of the inevitable safe haven buying explosion that will bury them more completely than the London gold pool ever was. Meanwhile, U.S. Mint Silver Eagle demand is now 35% above last year's record pace despite rationing of 1.8 million ounces per week. Shanghai silver inventories are down more than 50% in the past four months alone, and both gold and silver are experiencing historic levels of backwardation. Miners continue to report massive losses, and production is collapsing, and frankly, I don't believe it will ever recover. 
And thus, I don't think there has ever been a time in history when the reasons for buying and valuations thereof of gold and silver have been more compelling. Remember, when the aforementioned safe haven buying surge commences, it will be a lack of supply that will be your biggest enemy. And thus, the key to get po is to get positioned before it takes place. Well, that's enough for today. Hopefully you're starting to realize the reality of the world is far different than what the money printing, market manipulation, and propaganda scheme is trying to tell you. Chinks in the armor are showing everywhere, no more so than this week, and it's only a matter of time that, like all the other fiat Ponzi schemes before it, this one too collapses. This is why you need to consider protecting your net worth now while there's still a chance. And if you do, we hope you'll call Miles Franklin at 800-822-8080 and give us a chance to earn your business. And as always, you can contact me with any questions you might have at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Thanks very much.